in part by viewers like you and by the following. I had some concerns about whether or not I might get COVID. I have a little dog that's 12 years old and I knew that it would be most difficult to rehome her if something were to happen to me because she's a bit of a challenge to care for. So I recognize how important I am in her life. And I'd like to be here to walk her to the finish line. If you're on the fence, get vaccinated. In 1945, Walter Smith Sr. opened a family business in his name. Four generations in, and the Smith family remains committed to the ideals he set forth. Offer furniture for all Chicagoans, including a variety of styles and price points, and provide service to all who enter our doors, including in-store and in-home design assistants. We look forward to welcoming you into the Smith family, just as we have since 1945. WTTW shares our gratitude with Alexandra and John Nichols for their leadership commitment to trusted news and public affairs programming. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz live in River North. On the show tonight. My name is Cam Buckner and I'm announcing my candidacy to be the next mayor of Chicago. One-on-one -on -one with the newest candidate to enter the race for Chicago mayor. Our babies literally do not have the formula that they need to survive a baby formula company says it's ready to reopen its Michigan plant as parents struggle to find the product on store shelves. Gambling affects everybody, and so everybody can and should be involved in the conversations. A live neighborhood report from River North, the potential home of Chicago's first temporary casino. Several months after a sex abuse scandal erupts at Chicago's beaches and pools, the Park District now has a new leader. But it's got a long history and it's something to be proud of. Inside an effort to document a classic form of affordable housing in Chicago and keep it from the wrecking ball. What makes um, them especially unique is really their site, as you can see with this one. Details on an upcoming home tour designed by three generations. And this promises to be a really good one. Local astronomer Joe Guzman gives us a preview of what to look out for dur during this weekend's lunar eclipse. And Brandis, as we mentioned, I am live in River North as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series where the local aldermen and residents want to put a halt to a plan to put the temporary Chicago casino in this historic building right behind me, the Medina Temple. We'll find out why and we'll talk about a general spike in crime in this neighborhood in recent years. But first, we toss it back to you. Paris, thank you. And now to some of today's top stories. Ten members of a Chicago street gang have been arrested and charged with federal drug conspiracy. U.S. Attorney John Lausch says the investigation led to the seizure of multiple kilograms of heroin, some of which laced with fentanyl as well as cocaine. In addition to 10 men, at least 21 others have also been charged in Cook County with state drug offenses related to that investigation. Chicago Public Schools Chief Pedro Martinez announces he's tested positive for COVID-19. Martinez says he's fully vaccinated and boosted and experiencing mild COVID symptoms. He will work from home following CDC guidelines for isolation. In a statement, Martinez says, quote, this is a good opportunity to remind our CPS staff and families to please get vaccinated and boosted. Because of the vaccine, I expect that I will be fine. President Joe Biden marched the grim milestone of one million COVID deaths today at a global summit. We mark a tragic milestone here in the United States. One million COVID deaths, one million empty chairs around the family dinner table, each 
irreplaceable, irreplaceable losses, each leaving behind a family, a community, forever changed because of this pandemic. The coronavirus has killed more than 999,000 people in the U.S., according to figures compiled by Johns Hopkins University. In Illinois, there have been more than 3.2 million COVID cases since the start of the pandemic and over 33,698 deaths. Up next, we're in River North, where residents and business owners are preparing for a possible temporary casino. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. City council members and residents are scrambling to figure out more about plans to move a giant temporary Chicago casino into the historic Medina Temple. It's located in the heart of the fashionable River North neighborhood, home to tourism, commerce, and lots of residential units. The mayor has signaled she wants a vote on this giant casino plan, which includes the temporary spot in less than two weeks. Paris Schutz and producer Acacia Hernandez have spent the day reporting in the area as part of our In Your Neighborhood series, and Paris joins us live right outside Medina Temple. Hey, Paris. Hey, Brennis. Yeah, the early returns here on this potential plan to bring a temporary Bally's Chicago Casino to the historic Medina Temple building right there behind me are thumbs down right now. The local residents association says it conducted a survey of more than 2,000 people. 87% of those respondents said no, they do not want a casino here. And they're also worried that the city has not come up with any plans to mitigate the traffic that would cause the possible public safety issues that would cause. Now, we should mention that there is a town hall meeting going on right now at UIC on the casino plan in Toto, and that includes folks airing their grievances on this temporary plan to bring the casino to Medina Temple for the next few years. Now, the temple is a historic building, as we mentioned. It housed Bloomingdale's from 2000 to 2020. It now sits empty. Of course, that legendary Moorish architecture has become very well known across the country. It was built 110 years ago. It has a beautiful theater, or it had a beautiful theater in there that was known all around the world as one of the best acoustically sounding rooms anywhere. And the Chicago Symphony Orchestra used to record albums there. That's how good that theater is. We'll see if Bally's wants to restore any of that former glory. But either way, neighbors are saying, please, anything in this building but a casino. The Medina Temple location is a terrible idea. Uh, we think it's it's very ill-suited. It's a wonderful uh, piece of architecture. We love the building. We want to see something wonderful done there. It should be a theater or it should be restaurants or it should be retail, some kind of cultural institution. But a casino is about the worst use you can imagine for that iconic building. That's a heavy commercial district. There's a lot of tourist traffic there. There's obviously a lot of pedestrian traffic. And there are a lot of residents that live within a few blocks of that site. Um, we have had tremendous feedback from people who live in those buildings, and they are very upset about this decision. And when the final permanent casino goes in, in River West, should this be approved, it means 3,400 new slots and nearly 200 new table games. So with that comes the added threat of gambling addiction. But Elizabeth Thielen of Nikasa Behavioral Health Services said the state has vastly increased gambling addiction services in the last several years. The state has worked really hard to expand the treatment options. So we went from having six or seven treatment providers uh, in the whole state to uh, 30 different programs. We've got many certified gambling counselors, and it's growing. And there's also telehealth available. So if somebody needs help and there's no agency near them, um, a place like us or other places that are providing telehealth services can work with them from the comfort of their own home. And how do the myriad local restaurant and entertainment establishments around here feel about a casino at Medina? Well, Untitled Supper Club is known for its casino-like stage shows, burlesque shows, live music. Its general manager told us he has an open mind. I don't think anybody can imagine what it's going to be like. Um, there's going to be a lot of fo more foot, foot traffic, uh, a lot more business. Uh, I don't really know what to expect. 
and this is going to be a first for the city. Well, we can, uh, you know, adjust ourselves to see what they're looking for. Obviously, if they're looking for a dinner and a show, we can provide that. Um, I'm assuming the casino would provide something similar to that as well, too. But I'm not really sure what to expect from them. And amid all this, River North has struggled with a rise in crime since the onset of COVID, especially suffering those two mass looting events in the summer of 2020 and a recent string of attempted robberies at nearby CTA stations. There was a shooting in this neighborhood within the last couple of weeks. The Residents Association told us that the first four months of this year has seen higher than normal crime numbers across the board. 230 motor vehicle thefts, 368 thefts, 75 burglaries, 55 aggravated batteries, 110 robberies, 76 criminal sexual assaults, and three murders in the 18th district. Obviously, it's a dreadful thing. Uh, people are very worried about it. There's probably nothing that is more concerning and creates more fear and anxiety on the part of residents in our community than the increases in serious crime over the last couple of years. And just a bit later on in the program, we're going to speak with local alderman Brendan Riley, who is a vociferous opponent of this plan. We'll ask him why he is likening it to a potential another parking meter deal. All that and more just a bit. But first, Brandis, we toss it back to you. A shortage of baby formula is turning into a crisis across the country. Families are struggling to get their hands on a variety of formulas. And when they do, it's in limited amounts. The shortage means there's 40% less formula nationwide and families are turning to alternative ways to feed their babies, which has medical professionals sounding the alarm. So here to talk about the problem and what families can do are Machek Novak, the interim dean at Loyola University's School of Business, Dr. Joanne Romano Keeler, a neonatologist and chair of UI Health's Nutrition Committee for NICU and Special Care Nursery, and Summer Kelly, Executive Director for Mother's Milk Bank of the Western Great Lakes. Thanks to all of you for joining us. So we learned today that uh, North Shore-based Abbott Labs is hoping to restart production, saying in a statement, quote, uh, we understand the situation is urgent. Getting Sturgis up and running will help alleviate the shortage. Subject to FDA approval, we could restart the site within two weeks. Dr. Romano Keeler, uh, how will resuming production at this facility help with the current crisis? Um, I, I think it'll help tremendously. Um, we know that there's been this acute issue of bacterial contamination um, that's triggered the shutdown. Um, but the reason that it's so important for its um, facilities to reopen is that this um, acute shortage came on top of a lot of long-standing problems um, that have been an issue during the pandemic. Um, so now more than ever, having the supply chain of formula up and running um, is critical for our families. Majek Novak, uh, how soon before parents might notice uh, an improvement in the stock on store shelves? Well, uh, the, they they say it'll be probably about six to eight weeks for this plant to get its uh, products after it's up and running. Um, but ultimately, it's uh, part of a, a factor of how demand reacts uh, and and how quickly that supply gets out. So if uh, if there's continues to be a, a high demand, it may be, take a little bit longer before people feel that. So we know that lawmakers have also been pushing for this plant to uh, reopen. Uh, here's U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth uh, talking about the need for urgency. My conversations with Abbott and the FDA is for the two of them to work together so that Abbott can bring its factory immediately up to safety standards and that the FDA does not wait to inspect. Like, don't say, OK, you're ready. Well, we'll give you an appointment in two weeks, then we'll come and, inve and, and, and inspect. You need to go inspect tomorrow. Dr. Romano Keeler, how at ease can parents feel uh, feeding Similac to babies after what was a possible bacterial contamination? First of all, I want to say I 100% agree with those sentiments. This is really an urgent um, matter. Um, I think families should feel safe after this plant reopens in using the formula. Things have really been scrutinized. Um, the safety of these products as they reopen has been insured on multiple levels. Um, so I feel comfortable with my patients um, resuming use of, of these products.
Machak Novak, what, uh, what's been the impact of the supply chain crisis on the baby formula shortage? Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the, the supply chain. Um, as Dr. Romano Keeler noted, uh, there were issues before, just like we saw with, see with pretty much everything in, uh, in, in on, on our uh, store shelves, there are uh, limited quantities because of the pandemic. And when there, this recall happened, the plant shut down, it created, uh, similar to what we saw with the toilet paper shortage, there was a run on baby formula, not surprisingly, something that's really important and people want to make sure they have enough of. And so they went out and bought more and that exacerbated this problem. And ultimately there's way more demand than there is supply at this point. Summer Kelly, I want to get you in here because, of course, we know the benefits of uh, breastfeeding and breast milk, but that is not an option for every mother for a variety of issues. Um, for some families, though, donated breast milk can be an option. Tell us a little bit about how uh, that works. Yeah, absolutely. Most of the milk that we dispense here at Mother's Milk Bank of the Western Great Lakes is dispensed to hospitals like the neonatology unit that Dr. Romano Keeler works at. But we also have milk available for families at home, families that may be, you know, out of formula or families with infants with medical needs. So they can reach out to us here at the milk bank and we can dispense safe pasteurized human milk products uh, to any family in Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Keeler, Dr. Romano Keeler, the babies who are most at risk uh, in this shortage are those who are premature and babies with food allergies. Uh, what's your advice to families uh, as they're struggling with finding food? Yeah, that's really a particularly vulnerable population, um, particularly as their intestines and immune systems develop. Um, we continue, as we always have with our premature infants, to advocate strongly um, for them to try nursing or expressing breast milk. And our lactation consultants are really all hands on deck um, during this uh, national crisis. Um, for babies with food allergies or whose moms can't um, produce milk, as, as some were described, um, we recommend they're um, trying an alternative product um, by another manufacturer. But all of this really takes the support of our, our pediatricians and our parents really need to know that um, we're here as a resource to, to guide them through some of these challenging decisions. And of course, Summer, in the meantime, you know, some people have, have taken it upon themselves to share recipes for homemade formula online. What is your advice? What's your warning there? I, I have a very strong warning against homemade formulas. Um, they're not tested. Uh, they could be contaminated with bacteria as well. So I do strongly encourage families to seek, um, you know, reputable formula from stores and from pharmacies and to also reach out to the milk bank if they're in need of milk for their babies. Machak, another part of the problem is that, you know, the shortage has shed light on the fact that there are only two companies that produce pretty much all the formula, not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, should there be more? Should there be more competition production in the market? Well, this was a bit of a, a perfect storm of events. I think the, the reaction of the FDA was, uh, it, it was uh, accurate in that there was uh, a concern and, and they felt that there was a recall, shut this plant down to make sure that everything is safe. Um, had this happened outside of the pandemic, um, we, I, I would imagine we wouldn't have experienced uh, this, this uh, Event. So uh, for another manufacturer to come in and ramp up production and meet all of the FDA standards, it would take uh, so long. It's, it's really, it's tough to, to enter this industry. So uh, I think, I, well, I, I would expect that we are in a somewhat rare uh, event. And Summer, I'm going to give you the last word. We've got about 30 seconds left. Uh, have you all noticed any supply issues uh, driven by this shortage uh, in, in formula? Has it increased demand, I imagine? We have seen a little bit of an increase in demand, and luckily we're able to provide milk to all of these families thanks to the generosity of milk donors, the superheroes that provide uh, life-saving donor milk for families all throughout the United States. So I want to thank all of the generous milk donors for donating. Um, and also this kind of shines a spotlight on breastfeeding support, providing more support for families um, so that they can meet their breastfeeding goals. 
Okay, we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Dr. Joanne Romano Keeler, Machek Novak, and Summer Kelly for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, efforts to document and preserve a classic form of affordable housing in Chicago. Stay with us. Thousands of Puerto Ricans are taking to the streets to protest massive blackouts. Over the years, Mexican culture, from food to music, has become woven into the city's tapestry. Medical professionals share the latest recommendations on COVID-19 booster shots. DACA recipients have been facing longer delays than normal in their status renewal. Little Village is one of my favorite neighborhoods. This neighborhood comes together to celebrate such an important day in our culture. And we'll have that story on affordable housing in just a moment. But first, the race for Chicago mayor just got another entrant. Illinois State Representative Cam Buckner says he's tossing his hat into the ring. Buckner is the third major candidate to announce a bid, joining businessman Willie Wilson and 15th Ward Alderman Ray Lopez. And joining us now is mayoral candidate State Representative Cam Buckner. Thanks for being here. Uh, Representative, first question, why do you want this job? Listen, because I, I love Chicago, Brandis. Uh, I was born and raised here. Uh, I'm a native Southsider. I have uh, decided to leave, keep my roots in Chicago and, and raise my child and my family here. And I know that Chicago um, has a lot more room to grow, a lot more room to develop. I know as I talk to people around the city that they just uh, don't believe that there's a plan uh, to move us forward. And so uh, I love Chicago. I want to bet on Chicago, and I think Chicago is worth fighting for. And so I'm jumping in the race. Now, of course, every candidate uh, who runs for mayor knows that crime is going to be a major issue uh, for that job. What specifically would you do to lower crime in Chicago? There's a few things we have to do immediately. Um, first, we have to address the fact that we have about a 1,500 officer uh, shortage right now. We also have you know, between five and 600 officers who probably will retire uh, between now and the end of the summer. So we got to find a way to replenish our ranks and replenish them with folks who uh, very often have been left behind people from communities who have been most affected uh, by violence these are the folks who need to be doing the work on the ground if they want to commit to serving and protect in this city uh, we also have to figure out the difference uh, uh how to invest in, in a difference between public safety and public security right security being um, those factors that happen in, in the streets of chicago things like getting shot uh, things like getting carjacked and so we have to put the proper money in law enforcement to do those jobs the right way but also um, from the public safety standpoint uh, safety being the things, uh, the, the factors that make those things possible, like poverty, um, like lack of uh, resources for our educational system, like lack of uh, affordable housing. So we've got to pull this out together. We've got to increase our violence prevention budget. Last year, we spent about $16 million uh, on gun violence prevention. $16 million is, is a paltry amount when you look at the city's entire budget. And so uh, I've said this, we've got to treat violence in Chicago the same way that we treated COVID-19. And that means that we were willing to do whatever we had to do and pay whatever we had to pay to make sure we addressed it. And that needs to be the same stance we take with the violence in Chicago. Of course, education is another major uh, issue. You've been endorsed by the Chicago Teachers Union. Some other unions have endorsed you as well. But how would you work with CTU uh, and obviously as the head of uh, as the mayor and therefore uh, with a lot of responsibility for CPS? How would you work with the union going forward? Right, it's for far too long. Uh, there has been a, a, a rift between the mayor's office uh, and the folks on the ground doing the work. We have to make sure that there is some symbiosis and some, some connectivity between the Fifth Floor City Hall and the folks who are actually in the classroom and trying to educate the young people in the city. What I said today, and I want to what I want to reiterate today, uh, as well on, on this program, is that we know we have a teachers' contract coming up in June of 2024. The, the current contract expires, and those folks who I talk to every day, uh, my neighbors, my friends who have school-aged children, they're worried uh, that that um, contract is going to create another opportunity for dissension, right? Uh, what I want to promise the people of Chicago is that on day one, not in June of 2024, but on day one on the job, I will begin to negotiate that contract myself. I won't do it by proxy. I won't do it by press release or from behind the podium. I would do it myself from my kitchen table if I have to, because that's how important this is to make sure that we have some continuity for our young people and their parents and the teachers. So you plan to get uh, directly involved. Now, you've also served in the State House since 2019, uh, so just three years. But how has that experience and your other work experience prepared you for this job? Yeah, I, I've, I've done a lot before I got to the State House as well. Um, I spent time uh, in the federal government working on Capitol Hill in the U.S. Senate. I've spent time in uh, local government 
uh, when I worked for the mayor of New Orleans, uh, and now obviously on, on the state level. Uh, I've spent time in the public and the private sector. I have worked in academia, uh, both as a professor at the University of Chicago uh, and a trustee uh, at Chicago State University. Uh, I've been able to run a nonprofit here in, in the city that, um, that reached 70,000 young people throughout Chicago, right? And so uh, my work and my commitment to the city has been very clear. But even through my work in Springfield, um, I am now the, the chair of the 22-member Illinois House Black Caucus. Uh, and if you look at the work that we've been able to do on criminal legal reform, on education reform, on healthcare and healthcare delivery. Uh, I've been in the middle of all those conversations. And I also um, had the great pleasure to be one of the lead negotiators on what we passed last year as the most comprehensive and consequential clean energy legislation in this entire country. Uh, and so my track record is very clear. Uh, it's known, I'm a person who brings people together and gets solutions, um, you know, gets, gets to a solution. So uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot's campaign, though she has yet to formally announce that she is running again, but her campaign uh, tells WTTW News that you haven't quite shown uh, in your public life the kind of toughness that they believe is necessary to be mayor of Chicago. Um, they also claim that you still voted for former House Speaker Michael Madigan uh, to remain on as Speaker. We all know now that he is facing federal indictment, but what is your response to that criticism from the Lightfoot campaign? Well, the first thing is that, you know, three, minute, three minutes into this campaign, I'm already um, you know, being uh, being attacked by uh, this mayor. Um, listen, the truth of the matter is that anybody can go back and fact check it. Fact check that. I have only voted for speaker once in my life, uh, once in my uh, time in Springfield, and the person who I voted for was Chris, Chris Welch. Uh, and so, um, you know, that that statement is completely off base. It's completely untrue. What do you make of their attempt to to, to link you to the former speaker? I, I get it. It's, uh, it, it sounds like a, a desperate plea um, to once again create some uh, some ad hominem attacks, which I won't. You know, I won't. I won't stoop to that level. What I will say is that uh, when anybody who uh, is in this race, whether it's the incumbent or um, anyone else, wants to have conversations about the real things that are going on in Chicago, uh, the real things that uh, that are at our doorstep, and how we figure out solutions and figure out a way to deal with those issues, I'm happy to have those conversations. Uh, and not, you know, make up things like it's just made up in that, in that, in that quote. Uh, aside from crime and education, what would you do to improve the economics of the city? It's a big deal. So uh, much of my district now is the central business district. I've got much of downtown and River North and Streeterville and the Gold Coast. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of representing that, that space since 2019. Um, you know, we know that there has not uh, been a real plan on what we're going to do with our co commercial corridors, how we take our central business district and make it uh, usable and effective for this new world that we live in, right? The, the not post COVID-19 world, but the with COVID-19 world. Um, we're gonna have those conversations. We also gotta make it easier for folks to do business in this city um, for, for um, as I said earlier, if, if, if you are a, a national retailer, um, such as Whole Foods, you need to know that a promise that you make to our city, to our communities has to be a promise that you keep. Uh, if you are an international uh, company like Boeing, and you decide to move here, we need to make it uh, possible for you to not just move here, but to stay here and to expand. Uh, and whether it's a small business on 35th Street or, or Austin or Madison um, or Argyle, we got to do the work to make sure that businesses feel comfortable in the space. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. I understand it's also your 37th birthday, uh, the day you chose to make this announcement. Uh, best of luck to you. State Representative Cam Buckner, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brandis. Chicago, they say, is a city of neighborhoods, and the origins of those neighborhoods occupy a unique place among American cities. Neither master-planned communities nor built on land controlled by old money. Much of Chicago is defined by its residential buildings, a beautiful mishmash of styles, sizes, and ages. As Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, preservationists are calling attention to a style of home known as workers' cottages, an original form of affordable housing. Does anyone have any specific questions before we start? On a chilly April morning, a group of historic preservation students from the School of the Art Institute gathered in McKinley Park before heading out into the neighborhood to survey its workers' cottages. Make sure that one of you shared your location with me so I can find you, okay? And I will meet with every group today. Okay. Go! They're simple homes of four to six rooms with a gabled roof at the front of the house and an entrance off to one side, usually one story, sometimes two. Okay, we're going to take a picture here. 
Workers' cottages are ubiquitous in Chicago, though they're perhaps not as well known by name as their younger sibling, the bungalow. But once you start recognizing this type of house, you start seeing them all over the place, and they're they're interesting. They have a the history of the families that lived in them is not wasn't famous people or rich people. They were regular Chicagoans. Matt Bergstrom co-founded the Chicago Workers' Cottage Initiative because he saw them being demolished all around his home in Logan Square, where last year they launched their first survey with the help of Art Institute students and Preservation Chicago. When they're knocked down and they're being replaced by much bigger houses, it, it is really changing the character of a lot of neighborhoods. The Workers' Cottage Initiative estimates there are as many as 60,000 of these homes around the city. The earliest date back to the 1860s, but construction really started to take off in the 1880s. Because Chicago was the most dramatically growing city in the world at that time. There is no question about it that, that Chicago at this time is experiencing a growth of working class people and development of working class neighborhoods because industry is coming to the city, and I mean big industry. Many of those workers were moving out of tenements or were new immigrants who were able to form a neighborhood, often centered around a church, and find a new home. This opportunity to develop a new life and upward mobility is, is communal. And I think that's an important part. Plus, once you own land, you have a concern with politics and with um, American life. The Workers' Cottage Initiative tracked demolitions in Logan Square and Avondale between 2006 and 2020. In Logan Square, 46 percent of buildings knocked down were workers' cottages. In Avondale, 40 percent. It's important to recognize the significance of the workers' cottage, not only because of who they housed in the past, but who they can house now. So there's still such a potential for workers' cottages to fulfill our housing needs today. In many places where workers' cottages are knocked down, the new homes are larger and more expensive, meaning preservation isn't just about history, it's about holding on to the city's rapidly declining affordable housing. Chicago's architecture is housing because we have so much housing in Chicago. And housing, where people live, really resonates with Chicagoans. We hope to see that the houses are kept up and that people value the houses, that there's a pride in living in a worker's cottage, so why would you knock it down? It's a great place to live. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. And in McKinley Park, students found that nearly a quarter of the 4,000 plus parcels they surveyed were workers' cottages. There's also a survey of cottages in South Chicago that's set to, set to wrap up soon, and the initiative's planning to tackle another part of town next spring. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, a proposed temporary casino at the Medina Temple, that and more from our In Your Neighborhood series. Several months after a sex abuse scandal erupts at Chicago's beaches and pools, the Park District now has a new leader. We share those details. A look inside the former home of one of Chicago's most vital bankers, ahead of a tour happening this weekend on the South Side. And a celestial show is coming to Chicago. Local astronomer Joe Guzman gives us a preview of Sunday's lunar eclipse. But first, some more of today's top stories. An audit of the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services finds failures to provide proper medical care and track abuse. The audit from the Office of the Auditor General cites failures to conduct home safety checks before children return to their parents. It also found that children aren't receiving medical care. 88% of the 50 children tested were missing dental exams. 56% were missing their hearing screenings. The department and its director, Mark Smith, have already been in hot water for a host of reasons, one of them being that since December, at least five children who've been in contact with the agency have died. If you are an Illinois resident, you could be seeing some extra cash coming your way soon. Settlement checks are being sent to more than 1.4 million Facebook users across the state. That's part of a $650 million class action lawsuit against the company. The suit alleges that Facebook broke Illinois' privacy laws by collecting and storing biometric data of users without their consent. Now, Illinois residents who filed a valid claim under the settlement will get payments between $200 and $400. And it is hot in Chicago, it's not just you. So much so, the city set a new record, a new record high temperature yesterday when it reached 90 degrees. 
It is the earliest the city has notched a 90 degree day in more than a decade, according to the National Weather Service. On top of that, humidity sent the heat indices above 100 in the Chicago area. Temperatures are expected to feel a bit more spring-like next week with highs predicted in the upper 60s. And out of Paris, who spent the day in River North as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Paris. Yeah, Brandis, earlier this afternoon I spoke with 42nd Ward Alderman Brendan Riley, who says he had a myriad questions when this proposal came out. I asked him if the city or valleys had answered any of those questions. There still hasn't been a traffic study performed, no public safety analysis performed, and that's uh, extraordinary because in downtown Chicago, whenever we look at building a new high-rise, there's always a traffic study first to make sure that the infrastructure and the surrounding neighborhood can support the new project. And so for something this important to the city to not be supported already with a traffic study seems awfully strange to me. What's the, what is the, what's the sentiment from the residents here? It's overwhelmingly against. As you were setting up to interview me today, a group of ladies walked by and said, hey, that's our alderman. Vote no on that casino. Uh, it's overwhelming here um, because people understand the locations involved. The Tribune Publishing Plan has its own infrastructure challenges, and the city admitted during our casino hearing earlier this week that they're going to need to invest $75 million in infrastructure just to barely handle the traffic that would come with a casino. You can't widen the streets on Ontario and Ohio in the middle of River North here at Medina Temple. So if the other site, which has fewer constraints, needs $75 million in infrastructure, how on earth is, is Medina Temple going to work out? And anyone who lives in the immediate area knows, just intuitively, it won't. Overall, I mean, it's, I think you made the point that this looks like a parking meter deal and that it's a massive ordinance that you're giving, given no time here to digest. Uh, can you talk about, is this really potentially another parking meter deal? It, it has all the warning signs of one. Uh, obviously, we're not selling a public asset here, um, but the revenue deal that we strike here and the success of the casino is of utmost importance. And when we've been given one financial analysis prepared by a company affiliated with a parent company that raised money for Bally's just last year, $700 million deal, that raises some questions about the validity of that report. And when we were looking at the parking meter deal, we had to rely upon one financial analysis, which sounds very familiar. We were also told at the time, hurry up, don't ask too many questions, we gotta get this done. So there are a lot of similarities, and a lot of my colleagues that were around for the parking meter deal are feeling that. And so, again, uh, I think this requires a lot more deliberation and, and much better consideration for the sites that they proposed, both for the permanent casino and the temporary. Where are the votes right now? I mean, obviously, is this kind of an aldermanic prerogative thing with at least the, the temporary casino? Are they going to be with you or are they going to be with the mayor? Um, there are a lot of aldermen who are on the fence right now. Um, they're not real happy with how this process has been essentially short-circuited by the administration. We set up the special committee. Um, we've met for a grand total, well, thankfully we had a lengthy hearing in our, hearing in our second meeting, but only a grand total of six hours uh, to talk about a deal that's going to be important to this city for the next 50 or 60 years. I mean, we're staking our public pensions on it. Um, and so I think that requires more time to be vetted. Uh, and it just seems that the sites that were selected were done in a vacuum with no understanding of the context and infrastructure in these neighborhoods. I, I want to ask you a related question, and that is, it's warm now. We've seen a couple mass shootings already in this city. We saw some uh, unrest around uh, near Northside last night. Are you satisfied with, uh, with a public safety plan for River North uh, uh, for the next few months? Uh, no. Um, and we have great police commanders down here who are doing great work. And, and the police at the 18th Police District are working really hard. But we don't have enough of them. And we need them overnight. We have pretty good coverage downtown in the daylight hours when you see a lot of the tourists. And that's great. And it's reassuring to our tourists. But the critical time is, is really when it starts to get darker out. And, and that's where we're challenged still uh, for resources. And so um, I want to see a more robust com commitment to that. And we, I want to finally see some police officers riding on CTA trains. Year two I've been asking for that still hasn't happened. That's going to be critical to keeping downtown safe this time. Especially around some stops around here, Grand Avenue and, and so on and so forth. Red line stops, it's predictable. We know we're going to have crime and incidents at those stops every weekend. Again, that was Paris with Alderman Brendan Riley of the 42nd Ward. We will see Paris again later in the show with the owner of Moe's Cantina. It is official. The Chicago Park District has a new leader. 
This after a massive scandal plagued the district and ousted the last superintendent. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with more. Welcome back, Heather. So Rosa Escareño has been named the new Park District Superintendent after having served as the interim. Tell us about her. Well, she is a veteran of Chicago City Hall. For She has worked there for nearly 30 years. And in July, she retired as commissioner of the Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Department. She led that department through COVID, which of course forced businesses to shut down and limit capacity. And she said she was looking forward to learning, um, spending time with her family and learning how to run a marathon. But all of that changed in the fall when the scandal erupted in the Chicago Park District and Mayor Lori Lightfoot asked her to come out of retirement to lead the agency on an interim basis and now she's sticking around permanently. <laughs> so much for learning to, to get ready to run that marathon. Now as we mentioned this comes after a sexual abuse and harassment scandal that involved Chicago uh, Park District workers at the city's beaches and pools. Uh, remind us what that investigation found in the aftermath of it. Well, the agency, the Park District, I should say, essentially ignored repeated complaints from girls and young women who were employed as lifeguards at Chicago's beaches and pools that they were being sexually harassed and in some cases abused and even raped. Uh, those complaints lingered on the desk of Superintendent Mike Kelly for months before anything was done, done about them, and that was why Mayor Lori Lightfoot forced his ouster in October. October. Since then, two former lifeguards have been charged criminally in connection with the probe, and the Park District has all new leadership, including Escarreño, but also a new board president who replaced Avis Lavelle, who was in charge at the time of the scandal. All right, Maidi Hamilton serving as the new board president right now. Now, all of that said, Heather, you know, does Escarreño have a lot on her plate coming into this position? She sure does. She will oversee a new department in the Park District that is designed to handle these sort of complaints and to ensure that they're properly investigated and that they're not allowed to linger for months like it did before WBEZ first broke this story. Okay, Heather Sharon, thanks as always. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. Up next, a tour inside the former home of one of Chicago's most vital bankers. But first, a look at the weather. A family spanning three generations is responsible for the architectural design of more than 100 homes on the city's south side. The Hetherington family, to be exact. And this weekend, the Beverly Area Planning Association is partnering with the Ridge Historical Society to offer tours of some of these homes along with a photo exhibition highlighting their work and impact. Arts correspondent Angel Ito takes us to Beverly for a look inside one of the featured homes. In North Beverly, nestled along the Dan Ryan Woods, stand three homes, all designed by the Hetheringtons. The family of architectural designers worked on more than 100 homes in Beverly, Morgan Park, and Mount Greenwood. A new tour is highlighting some of those homes and some of the fascinating residents. Occupied by Audrius Pleopolis since 1999, this home was formerly owned by Al Capone's banker, John Bain. He was a very wealthy person. He was, a, you know, the most important banker in, in, in Chicago at the time. Bain occupied the home in the 1930s, and based on information shared by Bain's granddaughter and his own personal research, Cleopolis believes Bain was visited by Capone's organization on a regular basis. As the depression was setting in, and investments were going gradually tanking. The Capone organization demanded all its money to be taken out, and he had to guarantee it because he had the Capone people come over here and talk to him rather in graphic terms. What's going to happen to his family, his, his children, you know, what's going to happen to them. So he didn't understand. So he had to get all his money to, back to the Capone people. 
Now, when it came time to pay, Pleopolis says he could only think of one place Bain would stash all of the money he owed. If you're going to have a nice, convenient place to hide money, look over here. <laughs> what about here? <laughs> Library, that's a nice place to hide money. You could find a little nicks and crannies. When I've looked, there's no cash lying around or gold bars or anything that I can see. But to have some hidden secret compartments, it's very likely that they're here. From the light fixtures to the fireplace to the glass and the double doors, Pleopolis has maintained the original library in its entirety. But the home wasn't only occupied by Bain, it was also owned by the former vice president of General Motors, Oscar Arnold. He's responsible for a lot of the home design, including the hand-painted garlands Pleopolis commissioned. The garlands here are identical to the Dodge Mansion, most of the Dodge Mansion, exactly the same, the same uh, manufacturing. So what I think happened is that Arnold, uh, since he knew in Detroit, knew the mansion was being built, he ordered the same materials, the same suppliers, the same manufacturers in Detroit that were providing for the Dodge Mansion to build it for this house. While providing Chicago history, the home also offers a sad reality for black Chicagoans up until the 1960s. In 1928, in all the sales documents, the same covenant would appear that the house is being sold with the understanding that it will never be resold to anyone who is African American. And it does have an exception for hired help. So that racism is into the 60s and the covenants on the ownership. As for the Hetherington family's design style, researcher Tim Blackburn says there are lots of distinctions. Well, the three generations, you know, cover well over eight decades, probably if you include the third generation, Jack. He lived through close to 2000, and especially in the 1920s and 1930s, they focus on the revival styles, which go from Tudor, French eclectic, as well as American colonial revival. And so what you have behind us, the, the Driscoll Graver House, is a, of course a Tudor uh, revival house. What makes them especially unique is really their site. As you can see with this one, you know, they really are built for their location. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And these are just one of the many stories that folks will get a chance to hear about during Sunday's tour at noon. To learn more about the Hetheringtons and the residents that occupy them, you can visit our website. And now we check back in with Paris, who spent the day in River North as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Paris. Yeah, Brenda, so how do the local restaurants and bars and entertainment establishments feel about the prospects of a Permit, I'm sorry, a temporary casino right here behind me at the historic Medina Temple. Well, I spoke with the chair of the Illinois Restaurant Association, Sam Sanchez, who also happens to own a bunch of big restaurants and bars in River North, and here's what he had to say. We're hoping to draw in more, more tourists. We really are. I mean, I mean, new casino coming in. I mean, definitely going to keep a lot of people in the city. They're going to go and play, help them come and enjoy the restaurants they like. And we're not going to lose them to a... Uh, uh, this plane, when I go to Indiana, Juliet, we're going to keep them here. Uh, it's going to be good for the restaurant. Is there a th chance it could cannibalize some of the business if they have food and drink and entertainment there, or will it just all work no, together? No, you know what, there's so many people and uh, so much to give in the city of Chicago. We're sh it's sharing. I mean, I mean, everybody's going to compete with the best service and best quality. So, no, I mean, people are going to go to the casino and enjoy food there, and they're going to come and enjoy food at the restaurant. Are you worried about the traffic? A lot of folks have said, you know, it's just not going to be able to handle all the traffic of people going to a casino. There's <laughs> traffic every day. There's traffic every day. I mean, I drive in and out and out. There's no difference. There's, I mean, there's a congestion. I mean, it's a congested city. We live in a city. I mean, I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, here, I mean, we're re the Illinois Restaurant Association, and uh, we're supporting this because we believe that it's going to give opportunity to some minority participation for restaurants and employment. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities here. And not only that, is that the city needs funding. And then we have to have resources, and, and the resources for the police department is so much needed. We don't have enough police. We're missing police. You know, we got to get them more hired. They got to see that there's a pension benefit for them at the end. So, I mean, it's going to help the, fill the void that we're missing. That's the pension. Right, that money going into the pension system. So you, it's, you've taken a position not just supporting the temporary, but the, the permanent one, too, in River West. Is that the right spot for you, it? You know what? That's the spot they picked. I mean, it's still up to the city council. The 26 votes, not 50 votes, not 27, 26 votes. So uh, we're hoping to get uh, that the city council gets it together and uh, they vote on it. I mean, there is a lot of questions to be asked. 
Uh, we want to make sure that the minority participation is there, as, you know, as they promised. Uh, that the service, the hotel is participating, the unions are happy, I know they're happy, I mean, there are going to be union jobs there, and uh, they're good paying jobs, a good future, uh, so we're excited, we're supporting it, we're pushing forward on it, and if that's the location that was chosen, and then that's the location we're going to support. All right, let me get back to River North for a second, you know, there's been issues in the last couple of years of crime and carjackings. Uh, are, are you worried about the summer months here and, and whether the city's got a plan to keep it safe? So here, here's, the, here's the thing with the crime that's going on in the city of Chicago. I mean, it's going on all over the state, it's going all over the country. They're you know, not the only ones. I mean, it is bad and we see it bad. Our problem is prosecution. Okay, you could put a thousand more police officers, you could elect a new mayor if they choose to, but, but she's not the prosecutor and she's not the judge. So I would ask those questions to uh, uh, State Attorney uh, Kim Fox and Chief Justice Tim Evans, you know, the request from the mayor came very strong to no more electronic monitors for repeat violent offenders and carjackers. And that's what we're asking. I mean, you have to keep criminals in, in prison. I mean, if they're de detainees, need to stay in prison if they're a danger to society. There is not such thing unconstitutional because of the uh, 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 Supreme Court ruled on that that is not an absolute right. So if, from a restaurant owner perspective, this is what restaurant owners see as the big issue here. So the, the crime's always been an issue. It's going to be an issue. It's an issue. I mean, we just saw it last night on North Avenue, North Avenue Beach. I mean, we see it on the weekend. I mean, uh, you, we saw a shooting where uh, a guy punched another guy, and uh, he was shot five times, and he was not charged because they called it mutual combat. That's a little bit ridiculous. But, I mean, there is a law on that. But, I mean, that's not a, that's not a fair fight, which is that's what it's supposed to be. Uh, no, we, we, we need to prosecute. And then, and not only prosecute, I mean, you got to take the guns of the kids, you got to give them some trade. So we're going to work on trade schools. So I talked to the mayor. She supports me 100% on this. Well, you know, I'm, I'm on, on our committee. Uh, so I'm a co-chair of a committee. So we uh, talked to the, uh, the uh, John Sal uh, Juan Salgado regarding city, the city colleges. We are looking at a, at, a, at a school to bring high school students to learn some trades. So the only way we're going to eliminate crime is by creating jobs and skills and put in the fear that you will go to jail. But by that, we need a strong prosecutor. All right, so crime, a persistent concern here in River North, as is that temporary casino at Medina. And Brandis will be back to wrap things up in just a bit, but first we toss it back to you. Pierce, thank you. Up next, a preview of Sunday's lunar eclipse, but first, a look at some other events happening this weekend. A celestial show is coming to Chicago next weekend on the evening of Sunday, May 15th. A lunar eclipse will grace the night skies. Chicago astronomer Joe Guzman says it's a great reason to spend an evening moon gazing. Hi, fellow sky lovers. I'm Joe Guzman, the Chicago astronomer. And in this segment, we're going to discuss the upcoming exciting total lunar eclipse. And this promises to be a really good one. On Sunday evening, May 15th at 8.32 p.m., we will witness the start of this event, if weather permits. The lightest part of Earth's shadow, the penumbra, Latin for lighter part of the shadow, will slowly cover the lower left-hand portion of the moon, slightly darken it from the rest. Now, most won't notice the slight shading, but veteran lunar eclipse chasers will. Look for a slight darkening right at this lower left-hand part of the moon. This is where all the action begins. At 9.27 p.m., the darker part of our shadow, the umbra, starts to take a solid bite out of the moon. And here you can really see the curvature of the Earth against the surface of the moon. Now at 11.11, this is as dark as the lunar disk will get. We are now in total lunar immersion. And due to the forest fires out west, we may observe a deepest crimson blood red moon that we've ever seen. Then. At 11.53 p.m., the moon slowly starts to exit from our shadow, repeating what we observed at the very start, but in reverse. And at 1.53 a.m. Monday morning, just in time for work, it's over. The next one will be on November 7th of this year, but that one starts at 2 a.m. Catch this one if you can. 
Here in the Midwest, we get a front row seat to this event, and this is how to enjoy it under urban skies. First of all, total lunar eclipse are perfectly safe to observe, no protection needed. All you need are your eyes, a comfortable chair, and a blanket to enjoy. But to enhance this experience, grab a pair of binoculars and follow along in this five-hour celestial event. Those who have telescopes, set them up and share this experience with your family as we observe one celestial object get in the way of another. And always remember that the skies are free and so are the views. I'm Joe Guzman, the Chicago Astronomer. Guzman and his organization, Chicago Astronomer, host free sky, sky gazing events all over the city to connect people to the cosmos. You can follow him on Facebook and Twitter for the latest events, and you can find more of that on our website. We're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And before we go tonight, we'll check back in with Paris, who spent the day in River North as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Paris, what's your biggest takeaway from your time in River North today? Well, on the approval of this Medina Temporary Casino, the residents are thumbs down, businesses are thumbs up, although we did speak to someone just a second ago here who says he's from the suburbs, he works in the city, he thinks it's a perfect location for the casino. So if you live around here, not so great. If you don't live around here, what better place to put it than Medina? So we'll see how this all plays out. Yeah, this casino, it's not been, uh, it's not been a surefire bet for, for pretty much anyone uh, that we've heard from so far as we've been covering this. Paris, thank you. Um, so, and before right. we go, a clarification about something said in our Spotlight Politics segment last night. The company Safe Speed has not been charged or accused of wrongdoing, and the company blames a former executive for corrupt activity without the firm's knowledge. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7 for the weekend Review. And make sure to catch the Great Chicago Quiz Show with Jeffrey Baer tonight in just a few minutes. Our Amanda Venicky makes a guest appearance. Again, that is coming up at 8 p.m. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy this wonderful evening weather, and we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a proud sponsor of diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused free continuing legal education for lawyers throughout the region. Next time on the Great Chicago Quiz Show. Hello there. I'm so ready. That sounds like such a Chicago story. Like, it has to be true. <laughs> that is some brilliant deduction. Hey, the great Jeffrey Bear. Hey, everyone. Right on, Dilla. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it.